I've been going through like a lot of realizations lately about borderline personality disorder and really trying to get to the bottom of what it means to suffer borderline personality disorder. Um, there's no secret that it is, it, it's huge. It's a big, big part of your life. And I think there's not enough information out there about borderline personality disorder. It's really hard to find answers to the questions that I have. You know, you can Google borderline personality disorder and it'll give you a brief overview of like the symptoms. And there's a lot of descriptions on what someone with borderline personality disorder will like look like and, 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 and the types of things that they will do. And I can't seem to find really anything online or any any really literature or, or videos that doesn't make me feel like a pile of shit for having borderline personality disorder. Like, they seem to have this stereotype of a manipulative, abusive um, type of borderline. And I know for a fact that I'm, I'm not one of them. You know, everyone with borderline personality disorder is, is very different because you still have who you are as a person and the other things that have shaped you in your life, not just borderline personality disorder. And I think it manifests in everyone very differently. So to stereotype it, it really, really annoys the shit out of me. And I mean, I can only speak what it's like for me to have borderline personality disorder, but I know that a lot of people um, can relate. And I can relate to in, in some of the, the literature, um, you know, on being a borderline. But there are some parts of it that just seem so far from the truth, you know. I know when I first got diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, I was told that I just had a fear of uh, rejection, intense abandonment issues. Um, I was also told that, you know, I was unstable, you know, I, that I had really intense emotions. And it was like the onus was on me to control my emotions, you know, that there was something wrong with me, that I was the problem. And I completely agree that being a borderline um, can be really tough and that you do have to take ownership for it. You do have to learn how to control your emotions, you know. It takes years of therapy, years of research, you know, years of self-discovery to get to a point where you can effectively manage borderline personality disorder. But I find they tend to take this sort of victim shaming mentality with borderline personality disorder. I guess you go through feeling like you're a victim because people are hurting you in ways that you don't understand. And I think the diagnosis in itself is very like invalidating for an illness that focuses so much on needing validation for your emotions, needing validation for the way that you experience the world because it can be very different to other people. And I think a lot of people really get stuck on this topic. They'll post in the comments, you know, they'll say, you shouldn't say, I am borderline, you know, you should say, I have borderline. And I really think making the distinction doesn't make a load of difference. And I kind of think it's a load of crap. Like, who really gives a fuck how you talk about borderline personality disorder? The main thing to remember is that if you acknowledge that you have borderline personality disorder, you're already making headway you know into recovery and i think if you're talking about it that's great it shouldn't really matter how you talk about it and those people that claim they have all the answers it's like every time i get answers for a certain part of it more questions pop up i'm forever searching for the answers and there is no one answer and the more i learn about borderline personality disorder the more i you know realize how complex it is and it's like there's like step one, introduction to borderline, and, and, and there are so many stages into in being borderline. Um, there is stages not only within a relationship with someone who has borderline or if you're suffering borderline, but there is also this kind of giant life um, phases that you will go through in your journey with borderline personality disorder and, and your journey with self-discovery. And I think people really struggle with, like, what is borderline personality disorder? I'm not going to go into, you know, like, all of the symptoms. You can do a self-diagnosis, like, on, on, online. You can Google it. You know, what I want to talk about is the stuff that I can't find when I Google borderline personality disorder. The stuff that I can't, you know, that I've learned that I can't seem to find anyone else really talking about. 
and I really encourage you to subscribe to my channel and um, you know go back through and look at the different videos that I've posted because it's really interesting to see how my relationship with myself and my relationship with borderline personality disorder has changed you know over the years since when I first got diagnosed but simply put I think this is something that you will begin to understand at some point in your journey, but they don't kind of explain it to you in this way. Borderline personality disorder isn't just about not being able to handle your emotions or, or overreacting or emotional outbursts. It's, it is, I guess, a defect of your personality because you develop borderline personality disorder in the most fragile stage of your development, which is when you're a child. But what borderline personality disorder is, is it's the adult manifestation of psychological child abuse. It's how you develop as a person when your needs are not met as a child. When your parents don't teach you how to handle your emotions. When your parents don't sort of acknowledge what is the right and, and the wrong amount of emotion to feel. When you are invalidated, when you're told that your thoughts and your feelings don't matter. It's like you get sent on this like journey through life trying to prove that your thoughts and feelings do matter. Because if your thoughts and feelings don't matter, then you don't matter as a person. And we all want to feel significant. I mean, one of the most primal needs that we, we all need on a psychological level is acceptance. Is to know our place in the world. Is to really understand who we are and, and what makes us a person. And whether or not we're a good or bad person. And I think personally, when I'd been told by my family that I was a bad person from such a young age, purely because they didn't understand me, maybe it was because of, you know, my bipolar or, you know, some psychiatrists and psychologists have said it might have even been my intelligence level, that you find parents um, don't know how to deal with child adults or intelligent children or children that do have something like bipolar or an underlying health condition that makes them experience the world in a different way, that makes their emotions maybe, you know, bigger or more intense. So you're constantly being told that you're defective. And I think for me, that is what I've been fighting against my whole life. You know, I've been trying to prove that there is nothing wrong with me, only to find out that there is actually a lot wrong with me. But my psychiatrist said to me once, just because you have to change doesn't mean there's anything wrong with who you are. And I didn't really understand that at first, but the further I've gotten in, in my journey, I've realized that being told my whole life that there was something wrong with me made me begin to think that there actually was something wrong with me. And maybe there was nothing wrong with me to begin with. The fact that I grew up thinking there was something wrong with me is sort of my biggest issue that I have to, that I have to combat, that I have to deal with. And I'm really only beginning to learn now how much borderline actually affects my life. Sure, it manifests in relationships, um, particularly romantic relationships, but it manifests in every single relationship that you have in your life, whether it be with friends, whether it be with family, whether it be just, you know, anyone that you meet in the world. And I'm really starting to understand that another relationship that it probably affects the most out of them all is your relationship with yourself, is how you feel about yourself and how you feel as a person and, and how you see yourself in, in the world. And I think that's where this idea of being split becomes really interesting. Because my doctors have been saying, you know, you, you seem to have this like split sense of self. You know, one minute you feel really good about yourself and the next you feel really shit about yourself. You know, one minute I'm so self-conscious, I have so much low self-esteem, I feel completely worthless. I just feel like a piece of shit. And then the next minute, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm happy with where I am in life, things are like going well, and I keep fluctuating between the two, and I can fluctuate over, a, you know, a week, a month, a year, and sometimes I can do it like every five minutes. You know, one second I can be feeling good and confident, and the next minute I'm doubting myself, I'm feeling shit. 
And I think when you have a split sense of self, it kind of filters down to every other aspect of your life. You were never told that your emotions came on a spectrum. You know, that there was a spectrum for things in the world. It was either good or bad. It was black and white. You were either right or wrong. You were telling the truth or you were lying. And now I, I know from experience that this idea of like the ultimate truth is, is completely wrong and, and really naive and ignorant. Everyone has their own truth. And I think where my BPD stems, um, stems from is having a different truth to my parents. And I'm not talking about lying in the traditional sense of the word, but I'm talking about me saying, this is how I feel, this is what I think, and this is what I observe is going on right now. And being told, no, that's not what you think, no, that's not what you feel, because they know how I feel, they know what I think, like, because the way that they see the world is the only way that anyone should see the world. And I think when you're intelligent or when you're very, uh, you know, have these, these vast emotions or you're, you're an emotionally intelligent child, really in tune with the world around you, you're going to be criticized. You're going to be called a liar. You're going to be told that um, you're wrong just because people aren't capable of seeing your point of view. Because they're so stuck in their own little tiny world, they're not willing to acknowledge that a bigger world exists or even that your world exists. So you grow up feeling like you're not connected to anyone, yearning for connection, yearning for acceptance. Because that is one of the vital things that a child needs, you know, in their development, that people need. They need to feel like, you know, they fit in, you know, that they're accepted as part of a group. And when you're not, when you're outcasted, that really, I think, messes with your mind and it shapes the way you you live your life. You know, not being able to distinguish between whether I am borderline or I have borderline, you know, it was, it, you know, it got its claws in so early in my development when I was a child. I really do find it hard to distinguish what is me being borderline and what is being me because borderline has shaped me as a person. It's made me into who I am. And I don't always like you know, the person that I, I've become. I think they say, you know, I've just recently become open to this idea of idealis idealization and de-evaluation in relationships. For example, you either idolize someone or you begin to de-evaluate them. And it's like a coping mechanism with this fear of rejection where you, I guess, you sort of suddenly switch. You don't like that person anymore. And you don't like that person because you're pushing them away because, you know, suddenly it's been brought to attention that they might be able to hurt you. But I think you go through stages of idealizing yourself, of feeling great, of feeling like a good person, of feeling competent, of feeling like you can take on the world and you can do anything and you're special, to then de-evaluating yourself. And you go into this spiral of self-loathing, self-doubt, self-hate. And I'm constantly analyzing myself. I'm constantly trying to prove to myself that I am a good person. In the same way as a child, I was trying to prove to my parents that I was a good person. You know, that I was a worthy person. I was always seeking reassurance and validation. And that was something that I either didn't get or I got in a very specific way when I was achieving. You know, I was an overachieving child. So whenever I got an award, whenever I won first place, I was worthy. I was validated. And that instilled this really crazy success drive in my mind where if I wasn't successful and achieving, then I was nothing. And I think when I became severely mentally ill and my bipolar got out of control and I sort of left high school and achievement wasn't easy for me anymore, health functioning wasn't even easy on any form of level, all of a sudden I felt like a complete failure. And because that sense of success is what had sort of been counteracting my borderline for such a long time and was how I sought validation. When that was gone, I had no way of validating myself. I had no way of feeling validated by the people around me. And I think that is where my, my borderline really came out in its, its like full intensity. And it started affecting my relationships. And I think... I picked romantic partners, for example, narcissists, 
narcissists and borderlines have this very volatile relationship but they kind of seek each other out because borderlines like to make sure in the beginning that their partner feels good about themselves and all nar narcissists want is someone to tell them how amazing they are so borderlines are great in the beginning when they're in that idealization stage but it all falls apart when they start to realize that the narcissist is just a like a hurtful asshole and he doesn't give a shit about them so they're not going to fulfill the borderlines needs in any way and all of a sudden this devaluation starts to occur and it really goes on this downward spiral from there. It's sort of the borderlines start to hate them. They start to resent them. Um, and whether or not they're being manipulative, you know, their feelings are being hurt in some way. And narcissists are really good at hurting other people's feelings. Um, and I remember being stuck in these relationships where I would say, like, what you're doing is hurting my feelings. And they would simply say to me, no. Your feelings aren't hurt. No, I'm not hurting your feelings. Because there's this idea of blame. It's like... Nobody wants to accept blame um, for hurting someone's feelings. And I think borderlines come across as if they're laying blame to the people that have hurt their feelings. But that's not really what they're after. They don't want you to accept blame. What they want is they want you to accept their pain. They're hurting, and they might even not know exactly why it is they're hurting, but something that you have done has triggered something deep within them. And that's where this idea of compounding trauma really comes in. Because borderline to me is not just about an overreaction to your feelings, like we've fabricated this, this intense feeling out of nowhere. It's got to come from somewhere, and where does that come from? And it comes from, you know, trauma. It comes from childhood trauma or the traumas that you've experienced in your mm -hmm. life that have been invalidated, where people haven't, you know, acknowledged your pain. So every single time you feel that pain again and again, every single time someone does the same thing towards you or makes you feel the same way, it might have different causes. But whenever they make you feel the same way, that feeling is more intense. It compounds every single time you've ever felt like that in your life until suddenly you're an adult and those feelings are out of control and they don't subside. They just bubble underneath the surface. And I think the first step in your relationship with your own borderline personality disorder is understanding that it can be triggered, that these intense feelings come from somewhere and understanding what those triggers are. It could be different from everyone. But particularly fear of, of rejection and, and abandonment mm. is, is where most borderlines, mm. um, you know, the most of their hurt kind of stems from. So understanding that allows you to avoid them. Understanding that some people are going to be more triggering than others and asking yourself if you, if you can avoid those people. Because unfortunately, once you start a relationship with someone, once you open up that door to them once you let them into your life they almost become part of this i guess they they become part of who you are and them not accepting you really undermines your self-worth it undermines what you've been fighting for your entire life it it, it reiterates you know how you feel about yourself it, 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 it reiterates your greatest fears you know that you aren't a good person, that you, you aren't worthy of being loved, that you never will be loved, that there is something wrong with you. And I think that's, that is really what I have been running for and seeking validation my entire life, that there is nothing wrong with me. Um, and I think getting the diagnosis of being a borderline in itself doesn't kind of help with that regard unless you go through and start to get treatment. You know, people keep telling me it takes at least 10 years of intensive therapy, you know, and, and a lot of time and a lot of hard work to get through it. And I completely agree. And every single day I realize that there is more to being borderline than I ever thought before, you know, more than the stereotype. It literally is a part of everything I do. It's, it's a part of who I am. And I think self-reflection is going to be your biggest asset. Looking back and seeing how borderline has affected your relationships, but not just your relationships with others, how it's affected your relationship with yourself. 
and learning from your mistakes, learning about your triggers and learning why you feel the way that you do is kind of key to countering it. And I'm stuck in this really um, tough spot at the moment where I went through that whole journey. I realized what triggered me. I made a huge list of what I needed in a man and I made sure I wasn't going to get into another crappy relationship. And I sort of thought, I guess I had this illusion in my mind that I'd beaten the borderline trap. You know, I knew what I needed. I needed validation. You know, I needed a person who was going to be very validating. And I found someone like that. I found an amazing human being. But I think my biggest trouble is the subconscious levels of borderline that you don't even realize are there. All of a sudden, three months in, I'm de-evaluating that person. And whether or not there was a trigger, it's just the natural course of being borderline. I don't think I was idolizing them. I think I made a conscious effort not to. But the devaluation de still kicked in. And on a subconscious level, I sort of can't stand being around that person anymore. And it's like this illusion of safety around them. The illusion that they are the exception to the borderline rule is gone. Suddenly they do have the potential to hurt me. Suddenly... You know, they do have the potential to make me feel unsafe and make me feel crappy about myself. And I won't go into the exact detail of kind of how they did that because it was really accidental and really subconscious. But I don't really know how to move forward from that. I don't know how to re-evaluate someone because normally in a relationship I idolize them, they hurt me, then I de-evaluate them, and then I, you know, I say I don't want to be with them anymore, and then they say, no, they don't want to be with me because I've turned into a shit person. Then suddenly I'm like, no, don't leave me. And it's like this whole mindfuck, and it's like this backwards and forwards for months, maybe even years, depending how long you get stuck into that track, into this like never-ending cycle. And particularly when you're with someone like a narcissist or a really unhealthy partner, you will find this cycle will go on and it will get worse and worse because they will continue to cause that pain. They will continue to push your buttons on the triggers because they're not willing to understand you. They're not willing to understand your illness and their unwillingness translates as them not caring enough about you. Why wouldn't you do everything in your power to make someone feel better if you cared about them? Why wouldn't you simply stop standing them up or simply, you know, stop doing a behavior that makes them feel unsafe, that makes them feel unhappy, that makes them feel crappy? And I think a lot of partners like this narcissistic partner I had, he used to say to me, well, I'm not going to do as you say. I'm not going to, you know, follow your request simply because you asked me to. And I don't do what people tell me to do. And I'm like, I'm not telling you to do it. It's like what you're doing is really hurting me. And it's not a big deal. I know that. So I know it's not a big deal to change your behavior, which would then make me not feel as hurt all the time. And when they don't want to, for whatever reason, whether they can't or they're just making it a point not to, there's really no way out of that spiral because you begin to feel so crappy about yourself. And I think I idolize people more when I feel crappy about myself. And I de-evaluate them when I feel good about myself because suddenly I don't need them. And I think that's where this idea of splitting really comes into it. It's not just about relationships. It's about your relationship with yourself, being torn about who you are. And, you know, that's where I am borderline versus I have borderline. It doesn't fucking matter because it is a part of you. You can't run from it. You can't hide from it. And no matter how knowledgeable you become, it doesn't mean you're going to be any less susceptible to it. I'm aware of my triggers and I'm aware of a lot of these things happening as they happen, but I still lack a lot of the knowledge to learn how to deal with it. I'm still learning. I'm still practicing my DBT. I'm still going to therapy. And I honestly think there is no one cure. And if you think you found a cure, well, that's great for you. But I honestly don't know anyone that has found a cure. Because when I feel like I found the answer, suddenly I realize there's a, there's a thousand more questions like right now. I'm with an amazing person and I've started to de-evaluate them and how do I not do that? How do I start not idolizing them again but how do I start re-evaluating them again? And I think at this stage if you're in that sort of stage in your relationship with someone it's really important to ask yourself the question is it worth re-evaluating them? Are they unhealthy for me? 
Are they invalidating? Do they really provide what I need and what I want in a person? And as a borderline, you are going to have needs that you might not want to have. But it's a fact of life that you will have them. And I've put a lot of careful thought, careful time, careful analysis into the fact that this person is worth it. They are the most validating, kind, caring, considerate person I've ever met in my life. But I'm stuck on how, how to reevaluate that. And I think it's really important to take some time out. I've had to really take a step back because being in that situation, being around them when I'm de-evaluating them is like perpetuating the cycle. The more I'm around them, the more I de-evaluate them. So I think right now it's best for me to kind of love them from afar while I, I work on myself, while I try and figure out a way around it. And I'm doing so much Google searching, I'm asking a lot of questions and I'm not really finding the answers. And I think that's why I really wanted to do this video, because I really wish that there had been someone like me telling me the things that I now know to my younger self. Because these realizations, you know, they can be few and far between unless you have the dedication and the self-awareness to really analyze yourself, to really sit there and really acknowledge what your flaws are as a person. Because I think as a borderline, we run from our flaws. We don't want to have flaws. We've been told that we have flaws and it hurts. And it's, it's really hard to realize that you're not the perfect person that there is something wrong with you and we don't want there to be something wrong with us but I think until you like acknowledge what it is that you face and you really take a hard look at yourself with this split sense of self I've always tried to put the best version of myself forward the confident fun happy per person but the more I did that the more I tried to fake it until I made it it was like the gap between who I really was as a person who I felt on the inside and what I looked like and what I was portraying on the outside grew vaster and vaster and vaster until I was so torn. I was bound to snap. And I think in doing that, in, in hiding my true self, in running from my true self, I was actually not allowing myself to get the help that I really needed. I didn't allow myself to work on my low self-esteem because I didn't acknowledge it. I didn't allow myself to heal purely because I was running from, from that pain because I didn't want to feel that pain. And one thing that I really want you guys to get out of this today is that being a borderline isn't just about relationships, you know, with other people and romantic relationships. Being a borderline is really about yourself. And I've been depressed. I've been in treatment-resistant depression for years, for like 10 years or more. And there is no amount of medication that is going to help a certain type of depression that I have. And that is a depression that's caused by being borderline. This not feeling good about myself, this feeling suicidal, this feeling of, of intense anxiety of being unsafe because there is nowhere safe around me. There is nowhere that I feel safe because what makes me feel unsafe and what, me, what makes me feel crappy is how I feel about myself as a person. Until I really work on that. And working on that is hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. Admitting it. Admitting that I needed to work on that was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. And once you do that, you make very little and very slow progress. But I don't think you can really move forward in life. I don't think you can ever expect to be on a successful journey of recovery until you actually look at yourself. And accept responsibility for where you are in life and who you are as a person and your flaws. A wise man once said to me that the most powerful or the most power you can ever give yourself is accepting responsibility for everything that's ever happened in your life. And I think we don't want to accept fault. We don't want to accept responsibility because God forbid we look bad. So we run from it, we push it away, we lay blame on anyone and, and, and everyone that we could find. In doing so, I put myself in really abusive situations and relationships. People were abusing me and I was begging them to stop. Please stop abusing me. Please stop. You are hurting me. Please stop. I was giving them the power to stop the abuse simply because I was blaming them for it. Looking back now, if I had simply changed my attitude and accepted that the reason that I was being abused is because I was there, because I was letting them abuse me, 
I mean, one time, it's a mistake. But if you're letting someone abuse you for the hundredth and thousandth time and treat you like a piece of shit, begging them to stop treating you like a piece of shit is not going to help. In fact, it's giving them the power to make you feel like a piece of shit. And if you simply say to yourself, I am feeling like a piece of shit right now because of me, because I am letting them make me feel crappy. I am letting them hurt me. That's giving yourself the power to walk away. It's giving yourself the power to leave a situation that you don't want to be in and understanding that you don't have to be in a situation, that there is nothing that is necessary in this world, that you are your number one priority and you need to look out for yourself because no one else will. Trust me, no one else has your best interests at heart. So if you don't put your best interests at heart, then like no one is and you're going to get walked all over so don't let yourself be walked all over give yourself that power to leave it's not about standing up for yourself because we're constantly trying to stand up for ourselves and nobody is listening to us nobody is paying attention they're invalidating us so we scream louder and we scream louder because we just want to be heard we just want to be understood and if you're in a relationship with a borderline i offer you one piece of advice if they are trying to tell you that they are hurt, if they are trying to tell you that you have done something that has hurt their feelings, the best thing that you can ever do is simply say, I understand. Because all of a sudden you have validated their pain. You have showed them that you believe that their pain is real. And as a borderline, if someone says that to me, all of a sudden I just go, wow, okay, yeah, cool. Like, whatever we're fighting about, like, you, you get that I'm upset, you know? You, you understand, I'm in pain. So it's like suddenly my feelings are just they're gone they've gone from like a thousand all the way just back down to like normal like i'm chilled yeah you knew that i was upset that's like completely fine and i don't know i guess like my current boyfriend he's amazing and i think he was actually kind of made for me because he's had really shitty borderline partners in the past um that were very abusive and manipulative um but they didn't know that they had borderline. And I think that's where this stereotype comes from, from people that are like completely unaware. And I think being aware is the best thing that you can do for your partner. Being aware is the best thing that you can do for yourself. You know, whether it's keeping a diary, whether it's making mental notes, whether it's, you know, I sit back every single second of every single day and I reflect on how I'm feeling right now, how I felt throughout my entire life and I'm constantly searching for patterns and I know that that's just how my mind works and I'm told that it's like a superpower because not everyone thinks that way. But I think regardless, even if you don't have a mind that does that on a subconscious level, you really need to make a conscious effort to analyse yourself. And I'm starting to realise that despite how aware I am, despite how educated I am, there is still aspects of being a borderline that are there on such a subconscious level. I'm becoming aware of them, which is great. Um, but there's not everything I guess you can control on a really conscious level. You can make all the right choices, you can do all the right things, and, and it's it's still there. Because it's wrapped around who you are. It's wrapped. It's it's changed your personality. It's made you into this person. And I know I don't want to be this person. And I think the stigma around it makes it even worse. You know? And I just want you guys to know that you are not alone. Being a borderline is really hard. And this is a huge, hugely affecting my life right now. And, you know, the revelations that I'm having, the things that I'm learning, they're coming so fast that I'm, I'm researching all day, every day. I'm sitting there and I'm researching and I'm going to share everything that I find with you guys. Like if you have a look at my video from last night compared to today, it's like my mind's been blown with research that I've done. So make sure to subscribe, um, have a look through some of the videos. Um, if you guys have aspects of being borderline or bipolar or anything to do with mental illness or just being a person if you have any questions put them in the comments if you want me to do a video on certain topics then i'm more than happy to do it i'm always looking for ideas fresh things to research and i'm going to continue posting as my journey evolves because it's evolving quickly um and slowly in some areas but yeah i just want you guys to know that you're not alone and whilst being borderline sucks um I don't know, <laughs> there's not really many words that you can use to describe borderline in, in a positive light, um, but everybody is different, and 
if you're like me and you've read articles, you've talked to people about it, you've watched YouTube ba like channels and they've made you feel like a piece of shit for being borderline, like you're this manipulative, like witch, super bitch, psycho, crazy, abusive person, like, or the opposite, you know, um, don't let them make you feel like that because being borderline is more than that and if that's all you've gotten from this video today then that makes me really really happy so i look forward to your comments let me know what else you want to talk about and um i guess i'll be talking to you soon